All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Tanessa, the event coordinator for the FAU Libraries, and I would like to welcome you to this webinar, Embarking on the Homeschool Journey. Even though our buildings are not currently offering face-to-face -face events, the FAU Libraries work virtually to continue to provide support for teaching, research, and learning. We hope that you find that this webinar will do just that. Tonight, we are welcoming Simone Chin. She is a homeschooling mom to her two sons, ages five and eight. She's also the direct assistant director of the Sunflower Play Initiative, a community outreach program that strives to give all children access to child-directed free play. Before beginning her homeschool journey, she earned her doctorate in experimental psychology with an emphasis in cognition and development from Florida Atlantic University in 2014 and taught undergraduate and graduate level courses. We'll be taking questions throughout the presentation, so please feel free to type any that you may have into the chat box. Now that the housekeeping is out of the way, I'd like to turn it over to Simone. Hi, thank you, Tanessa. I'm happy to be here. It's eight o'clock at night. Um, I encourage you to grab a glass of wine or a cup of tea um, and just relax as I chat um, and tell you about my family's journey uh, when we started homeschooling. Um, I thank the FAU Libraries for having me and giving me this opportunity to um, speak to families um, who are interested in homeschooling or curious. Um, so this is my first webinar, um, so please bear with me. Um, with all the technology issues that may arise. But um, before we begin, if you want, you can just um, put in the chat um, where you're joining us from. Um, I'm in Boca Raton, Florida. Um, and so where you're joining us from, and um, if you have children, um, what are the ages of your children? I'd love to know. And like Tanessa said, um, if you have any questions, just type it in the chat and, uh, and I would love to answer them um, in real time for you. Oh, let me, okay, here you go. So, um, like Tessa said, I was a graduate student at FAU, so um, I love FAU for a few reasons, and one is that I went to grad school um, here or there, and um, got my PhD, and, and really, um, got to appreciate the campus and um, all the staff and faculty that work there that um, worked with me there and a second reason why i like fa or love fau is that i met my husband there um, right at the starbucks on campus um, so that's a moment i won't forget and um and it's in you know it, it's Definitely the campus at FAU is close to my heart and it's where we currently bring our kids um, to climb trees and to ride bikes and to just have fun um, on campus because it's a beautiful campus and the banyan trees are beautiful. Um, so those are, so I'm very happy and to be here. Okay. Simone, we have someone here who is from Lake Worth Beach and her son is 16. Okay, welcome. Welcome from Lake Worth Beach. Okay, thank you, Tanessa. Um, so when I started, um, well, before I, I start in telling you this, I never, never have I ever planned to homeschool. Um, that's something that I never thought I would do unless there was some sort of crisis, like a pandemic where schools were closed and kids had to stay home. Um, but that never, occurred to me and um, and I'll tell you what changed my mind. Um, so basically when um, when my older son was about three, uh, we joined a parent cooperative uh, preschool, a play-based preschool and um, parents are very involved in this preschool and I had a front row seat um, to really observe how children interact and play and um, and this is part of what I like to do since I did study developmental psych. Um, so I was able to really have an appreciation and to really observe a lot of children, not just my own play. Um, so for example, one of the stories that I remember, which really stuck with me is you had about five kids, mixed age between three to six, and they just got together and, and they noticed that you know, these worms were being displaced. And what was happening is that um, 
at the school, they were changing the planters. So they uprooted a lot of the plants and, and there were these worms all over. And they're like, oh, what are we going to do with these worms? Um, they need a home. You know, they they're no longer have a home. So the children um, among themselves, without the help of a teacher or a parent, decided that they are going to build a hotel for the worms because these worms were losing their home and they needed a home. So I was able to observe these five children work together and throw ideas out, um, accept ideas, um, and really come together, communicate, um, you know, even when they don't see eye to eye on things and, and collaborate um, for the greater good of making this worm hotel for the for the worms. And, you know, with an adult lens, you look at this pile of dirt and junk and you're like, that's just a pile of dirt and junk. But, um, you know, from observing the whole story from start to finish, I was able to see, wow, this is valuable stuff here. Um, you know, children are going to coming together. They're showing empathy. They're really, you know, listening to each other and I saw immediate value as an educator, but also as a parent. And I'm like, I want more of this for my children. And I don't want it to stop at preschool. And I want it to go on. So, um, so I thought, what if there's something more to play than just it being fun for children? And it turns out there is a wealth of research on play and the benefits of it. Um, but that was the beginning of me really wanting to, to think about ways of educating my children that are outside of the box, um, that are outside of the normal traditional schooling. Um, you know, another story is um, how my sons appreciate airplanes. Um, you know, my older son, when he was four, he made his first airplane, um, which didn't look much like an airplane, but it, it was pretty much a, a paper folded in half like that. And, um, and and he asked me, how do you make a paper airplane? And I tried from memory as a kid, um, didn't look that great. And then he asked dad and dad's airplane looked a whole lot better than mine. And and then he saw that, but that's all he wanted from us. He didn't want us to, to show him how to make it or to teach him. And, um, and he continued making paper airplanes on his own in his free time. Um, and at four, he had a whole bunch of free time. Um, he wasn't really doing anything else. And, and you know, he would seek um advice from others um you know grandparents would bring um, paper airplane books and he wouldn't really look at them he wasn't interested in it um and he just wanted to make his own airplanes well at age five one one year later you know we were in the car and i asked him hey tenson do you know what your inner genius is and the term inner genius i got from a psychologist um, from a conference a while back and and he didn't really and, and immediately he said yeah I know what it is I go oh okay you do he goes yeah it's making paper airplanes I go oh well how do you know that's your inner genius and he goes well I'm good at it and um, and I like to do it and when I make paper airplanes for other people it makes them happy so um, at five, he kind of blew me away because I'm like, wow, immediately he knew that paper airplanes was his thing. Um, and and he had such a confidence and a certainty that this was it. It's like as if he had an identity already, you know, this individualis individualism. And I'm like, wow. And and he did this all on his own without us intervening. Um, and I think also had i have told him like okay this is not how you make a paper airplane or let's take a class on making paper airplanes if i made it if i forced it on him or any i think the outcome would have been different but a, a year later he decided he's going to make a paper airplane that flew out and flew back at me or flew, flew back at him and and he did that and the day he did that, he was so excited. He called it the boomer glider. Um, and it really did fly on and fly off. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, oh, wow. Um, but it's this love of paper airplanes that he had. And it's and it made me think, like, what if education was like that in the terms of um, if we let children or if I let my child um, be, you know, lead his own path or his own interests and really let, allow him to 
to go down that rabbit hole and to really, you know, um, blossom on his own. Isn't that a great thing? Because, um, you know, Piaget said that when you teach a child something, you take away forever his chance of discovering it for himself. And I think if I had intervened or my husband had intervened and really took over his interest in paper airplanes and told him this is how you do it, then we wouldn't have seen um, his discoveries. And up until today, he's still making paper airplanes and my younger one is as well. Um, and they have a huge big box and they're flying it constantly. Um, so, um, so basically from this experience, I was like, I, it really forced me to relook and to really think, what do I want um, my children's education to be? Um, and I made a, a list, um, like a wish list. And, um, and this is what it looked like. So um, this was when my oldest was four, when I was touring kindergartens at the time. And we only toured um, public because we couldn't afford the private schools. So, we're, so one was I wanted time for child-directed unstructured play and a lot of time for that in the school day. Um, there's loads of research that shows the benefits of play. Um, some are very obvious like social and emotional skills children get to you know learn to get along but there is also some that's not so obvious like executive functioning and um, executive functioning like you know is responsible for paying attention organizing carrying out tasks um, and it shows that executive functioning is a predictor of success and academic success so um, those are some benefits of play and why I thought it was very important to have play during the day at school. Um, another thing on my wish list is that I was looking for a program that would support or focus on 21st century skills. And when I say that, I mean um, not, I don't mean skills like coding or cloud computing or uh, website development. I mean something less specific people skills, soft skills, I mean, creativity, collaboration, communication, critical thinking, empathy, adaptability, these skills that can be seen um, or that can be used in pretty much any field that you are in. Um, and I, I saw in you know, one of the articles in Educause um, earlier in the year that 85% of the jobs in 2030, um, the year that my son will graduate from high school, um, have not been invented yet, but we know that whatever jobs they are, creativity, collaboration, communication, critical thinking, and so forth are going to be very, very important in that. Um, so that was an important part of um, why um, I wanted a program that focused on those skills. Um, in my wish list. And then I wanted science every day. I wanted a program to nurture children's curiosity, to ask questions, to have questions, and also their creativity um, to think outside the box, to find solutions and adapt. Um, and I also wanted the schools to cover history, literature, process-oriented art, which is an art that allows children to express themselves, their individuality, and to experiment with different mediums. Um, and I didn't want them to have homework, especially at a young age. And I wanted them to have some time to wander, to explore, to tinker. Um, you know, tinker is just playing with materials um, without a goal or a purpose, but it's very important um, to do, especially, you know, in the experimental process. Um, but um, I told this to a friend and she looked at me like I was crazy and said, well, um, sounds like you're going to have to homeschool. I'm like, what? And and so I spoke to a friend of mine who was who was a teacher who did her master's, um, her master's thesis in homeschooling. And she said, basically, try it for a year and you can't mess up kindergarten. That's what she said. It's only a year. And so this, I decided to try it. I did. <laughs> um, Okay, so, um, you know, what is homeschooling? And so basically it's not sending your child to a traditional public or private school. Um, and there is an article 
uh, that was published last December 2019, um, and it's just full of stats, stats on homeschooling families and parents. If you're ever curious about who homeschools, what are they homeschool, they, they collected a lot of data and published it. Um, so from this um, article, I got some information that I'll share with you. And, you know, when you look at the top five reasons why parents homeschool, um, five being want to provide a non-traditional approach to education. And that was more along the lines of my reasoning um, because I had that wish list that was non-traditional, I guess. And um, the number one is reason is having concerns about the environment at school. Um, and that's, you know, that falls into along the lines of safety, um, negative peer pressure, bullying, drugs. Um, and right now we're looking at COVID as, you know, one of the reasons why parents are homeschooling since March. Um, and that would probably fall under concerns about the environment or dissatisfied with um, academic instruction at schools. Oh, hold on. Let me. There. Okay. Just want to let you know that someone shared that COVID is a big reason for them. Yeah. Um, yes, and uh, definitely. And I think that's why I felt drawn to to try to do this um, because it was like, okay, we have a lot of. I had some friends ask me questions on homeschooling, so I'm like, I wonder if others would benefit from just hearing how I got started or why I got started and, and learning from my, you know, my joys and my challenges. Um, so, yes, it is a big reason. Um, okay, so for me, I decided and I decided, okay, how are we going to tell dad? <laughs> so we're homeschooling, let's tell dad. Um, and, and, you know, and my my husband, children's father, is Asian and not many Asian people homeschool. And actually in the study, it shows about 3% of homeschoolers are Asian. You know, the bigger percentage is 60% um, are Caucasian and then 25% are Latino with about 8% being Black. So um, I had to come up with a plan, a plan of persuasion, a POP, to say, okay, we're going to try this for a year. And so his first question was like, who homeschools? And then I'd tell him, well, we wouldn't be alone. There's quite a few people who homeschool. And um, on the Palm Beach County District website, public, public um, county um, school website, they said about 50, approximately 54,000 families homeschool in Florida. I don't think that includes since March. I think that's before then. Um, so quite a bit of homeschool families in Florida here. And um, so we're not alone. <laughs> um, and then the, and so another thing I had him do is I actually had him met with grownups who were homeschooled just so that he could see that, okay, when they're, you know, he asked some questions of what their childhood was like and just see basically the question that a lot of people have, are homeschool kids successful? Do they go to college? Do they have a job? And yes, yes. So, um, so we met a few homeschool kids or grownups that were homeschooled as kids and that helped him see like, okay, you know, unfortunately, it's like a stigma that homeschool families have that are these kids normal? Yes, they are normal. We, you know, they all become and it's great. Um, so that was one um, concern too is socialization, which is a big issue. It's a that's a big question I get from a lot of parents who are not homeschoolers is you know, what about the socialization? And um, and I can see their point because there is no standard um way of socializing homeschoolers as there is maybe children who do go to school like there's 30 minutes of recess and so forth um, some homeschoolers socialize a lot more than others um, so it's it, it you know it varies but i i can say that you know social media has changed i think that a lot providing opportunities for families to have social events for their children and also um, Older children, like teenagers, have the internet to make friends, <laughs> something that didn't happen 30 years ago. So um, socialization, 
uh, is uh, for a lot of families not really an issue. Um, homeschool families not really an issue because there are activities, there's meetups, there's drop off programs, and then there's also uh, an, you know opportunities to join a co op, which is a group of moms or a group of families, um, homeschool families that um, share. Uh, task of teaching and so forth. Um, and, and that is also a good thing to do is to join a co-op if you do homeschool, um, especially if you have younger ones. So you do have that, not only a socialization for the kids, but also for you just to have a support system um, because some days are really hard and you just need someone to say, oh, I, I understand, uh, I feel you. Um, so another question that my husband had is costs. Okay, so how much is this going to cost me? Um, and at that time, I didn't have an answer, um, but I said, it's, there's no fixed costs, which is true. There's no fixed costs for homeschooling like there is for like private school. Um, and there was a graph here um, or a visual here by New York Times, and it shows basically um, percentage of homeschoolers and how much they make in their you know family income. So what we do see is that the the cost varies where you can spend as little as a few hundred dollars on curriculum a year to homeschool and then it can go up to the thousands if you hire a tutor, if you outsource a lot of this the the teaching. Um, so it, it you know it just depends on what your family um, income is like and so forth, but the cost varies. Um, and then time. Um, one of the questions is how much time does this take? Uh, so can I work in homeschool? That's a that's a big question. Um, and the answer it, it is yes, I think it's possible because I do work part time, but I only work part time. I'm not a full time um, employee, but um, you do give up a lot of your time towards homeschooling. And I think you give up more during the younger years um, when your children are less independent. And for those who have teenagers, um, I think it takes less time because uh, one, even if you are teaching them all yourself, they are very, at that point, more independent um, to, to work on their schoolwork a little, by themselves, but also there are different opportunities, like there is virtual schooling for older children. Um, and also dual enrollment at a community college or at a university that um, a lot of high school homeschoolers enroll in. Um, so, you know, less, less work is done by the parent um, at that time. And here's a, a graph down here about hours per week homeschooled. And you see that about 50% said that they homeschool, that the kids are homeschooled for about 25 to 40 40 hours a day, which is comparable to a regular school. Um, but what's not said in here is that how much of that is actually instruction or how much of that is actually the children working um, on their own. So, but um, for my kids, it's more towards the, the very bottom, like one to 10, um, yeah, especially for my kindergartner. Um, and my third grader is probably around maybe 12 hours a week or you know, there's definitely takes less time to teach one child than to teach a class of 25. Um, so it, it's, it's not much instruction time and there are ways to outsource some of that through programs, um, whether it's um, activities or drop off programs or even virtual programs. Um, you know, one of the things that really convinced my husband, I think, was basically I told him, imagine how much time we would have together as a family when because the children would not be during school during school hours and they wouldn't have the homework, um, you know, into the evening hours, we would have more time together. And a study out of Anaheim said basically American families just spend about 37 minutes of quality time together per weekday. And um, that really resonated with him and said, OK. Um, I really want to spend time with the kids, and um, if this helps, then maybe we should try that. But I think that was the seller there for him. Okay. Okay, so um, great. So we're homeschooling. What did I need to do? So the first thing I had to do was to look up my um, county. 
school district, Palm Beach County, and um, look up their home education department and submit a letter of intent, which basically is a form. It's you don't really have to write a letter. Um, anyway, it's to basically say that we're homeschooling. No questions really asked. It's just uh, formality. It's the easiest part of homeschooling is to submit that. And once that was submitted, um, you know, we were ready to go. We we're on our way. We had nothing else to provide to the district until a year later. And, um, and a year later, that meant I would have to submit an evaluation signed by a certified teacher. So during that year, what we need to do is keep a portfolio of um, work that we did. And so I'll show you what I used, which was very helpful. I got this idea from a homeschool mom and it's one of these folders, plastic folders with a whole bunch of tabs in the middle. And what I would do was basically every month I would take some sort of work sample um, that my child is working on and file it away. So I have tabs for every subject that we studied um, on Earth, and I would just every month put something in. So for math, I would put one of his math worksheets, um, science, something from science that we did. Um, lots, you know, whatever program he participated in and got a certificate for, I would just file it in. Um, so basically, we needed a portfolio of work samples. Another thing is that we needed a reading list, basically. And for younger kids, it's obviously books that you've read to them. But for older ones, it's books that they read on their own. And it's just a list. That's all you need. Nothing else to be included except the titles and maybe authors of that. Um, and then also I, I put in a sheet of like what a sample schedule would look like and I would give this to the teacher um, that I found because you have to find a teacher, a certified teacher, it's a Florida teacher to evaluate your portfolio and what she needs to evaluate is progress, not how other, you know, kids his age are, are doing just progress. Basically, there was some progress from the beginning of the year to the end. It's, you know, they're not telling you how much progress is just basically, is there progress? Check it off, yes. Um, and I recommend finding a teacher um, who's homeschool friendly, um, and that will help help you, um, one who has experience dealing with homeschool evaluations, but also understands um, homeschool philosophy and programs. And um, I know a good teacher. Um, send me an email if you if you want to know a teacher. But um, there's also lots of teachers on social media with all the homeschool groups, Facebook and so forth that, you know, they just you, you can just send out a message. You need a teacher for an eval and you will get some um, some replies, I'm sure. Um, and they also post their information. Um, a teacher eval costs about 25 to 40 bucks, um, maybe higher for um, high schoolers because it's a lot more work that you have to keep track of. Um, in high school, you need to actually have keep track of the work for transcripts and it can get more complicated. Um, so that would need more guidance and more time. Um, for that one. Okay, so um, ready, set, learn. So I, I, I said, okay, so my husband's on board, uh, which is very important to have the father of your children or the other um, parent be on board as well, because it's definitely, I think, a two parent effort. Um, he's on board, we're gonna start. So it's ready, set, learn, right? Um, but what I did was I fell into the curriculum abyss, that's what I call it. Um, I kind of, you know, an analogy, basically there's a curriculum, curricula in homeschool for every single thing you think of, like how to learn math through Minecraft or um, how to play the recorder. There's curricula for everything. And, uh, you know, the way I felt was a bit overwhelmed. An analogy is basically when I was going into baby's R us for the first time. Pregnant, wanted a child car seat, went in there, 
and saw like 50 car seats and felt like, oh gosh, which one do I pick? You know, they all pretty much do the same thing. So, um, and so it's that same overwhelming feeling um, where you can just, you know, get lost in. So um, one of the things that helped me was I, I, I looked up Kathy Duffy reviews of curriculum and she reviews a lot of homeschooling curriculum and she gives her reviews online for free. And that was one way of um, basically um, being able to work way, my way through a lot of the curriculum. Another one is I use what I remember using as a child, which now I look at as not really maybe the best way, but I went with what, what was familiar to me. Um, and we started um, and we started in, with my older one. He was in kindergarten, five years old. Um, and, you know, three weeks in, someone asked him, oh, how is homeschooling going? He says, I hate homeschooling. And then I hear and I'm like, what? And so I'm a bit embarrassed because I'm like, really? And um, you're telling someone you hate homeschooling? And but um, <laughs> And then I'm like, I can't believe it. I'm spending all this time doing this. And so I figure, okay, maybe it was just the beginning and it's kind of rough in the, in the beginning, which it was. Um, so I gave it some time and someone else asked him like a month later, oh, how's homeschooling going? He says, I hate homeschooling again. And I'm like, oh, gosh, what's going on? And so we we talked and, you know, after feeling like a failure for like a minute, um, we talked and, and it came down to he really didn't like the math curriculum that I picked out. I picked out Saxon math, which is something I learned with and it worked for me. Um, I learned it in school. I wasn't homeschooled, but um, it didn't work for him. He said it was too long, too repetitive, and he's only in kindergarten telling me this. So um, this this was a humbling experience and also a learning experience and when i say ready set learn it means that i learned these things not for really um, the children but uh, so um so i had to to look at different math, math curriculum and really you know look at what his his strengths are what are his learning styles and um so we went with something different called math uc um and it works a lot better for him i think um because he's one to really he, once he gets the you know gets the um, concept he's ready to move on to something else he doesn't want to stay and repeat it over and over and over again he doesn't want that extra practice so um I think it works. He's not enthusiastic about math. He says, oh, I don't really, I mean, it's okay. He's not a lover of math, but that's not my job. I, you know, he doesn't have to love math, um, but he says he doesn't hate it. So I'll take that for sure. Um, but, you know, during this um, process, I was learning, you know, one of the things that parents ask me when they learn home when I when they find out that I homeschool is what curriculum are you using? And so I kind of um, equated curriculum to homeschooling, um, which is that's not the case. You know, homeschooling is so much more than curriculum. Um, and and this is what I, I learned because there's so much more to learn and you don't really need curriculum for all of that. Um, Another thing is that Pinterest classroom. I've seen it on social media. I've seen it on Pinterest, homeschool classrooms. They look tidy, they look neat, they look perfect. Um, uh, I thought we needed one of those because we're homeschooling and nope, it turns out we don't need that. It's a myth. We don't need a Pinterest classroom and it, not going to be perfect. It's not going to be clean. It's going to be messy. And I remember distinctly how I, I journaled one night and said how I ruined art for the boys. And it and it happened that when um, they were working on something with paint, something artsy with paint and water, and I, I came in and I saw them and there was a mess everywhere, paint on the floor, you know, and I just got so upset. I'm like, oh, this is such a big mess. And um, and and it, that's the reality of homeschooling. Sometimes you're just on edge and you overreact, you have a temper. And I got so upset at the mess that I didn't see what they were doing, um, you know, the, their creative process, or, you know, I was just really fixated on cleaning up. Um, and, and that made them feel bad. 
and I didn't want them to, you know, after cooling off and, and cleaning and all that, it, I, I said, I didn't want them to fear making a mess over using their creative process on art. Um, so I, I really had to, in my mind, expect a mess um, in homeschooling and not, you know, because which art room do you walk in and there's not paint on the floor and the walls, really? So why would my house be any different um, if I wanted my children to immerse themselves in art? So um, that's something I changed about myself and got rid of the Pinterest classroom and expect a mess because it is homeschooling is messy. Um, and another thing I found is that, you know, kids make a lot of things and it's important. Um, they make a lot of things with paper and, and tape. It's important to not take those away or throw them away right away. It's to keep them so that they see them. Um, and that's, they take a lot of, um, and I find that my children feel more confident and more prideful when they do see their creations about the house on display. Um, lastly, I had to learn about schedules um, and how schedules got in the way of learning, spontaneous learning or natural organic learning. Um, you know, it's one of those things like, um, for example, in the mornings, we usually go for a walk. So the kids and I went for a walk with the dog and came back and the house was and there were these birds flying around our house and it was something that we've never seen before and my older one's like oh chickadees chickadees are flying just flying and and there were just so many birds and it was like a flock of birds and they were just flying and he, he's like mom do you still have the bird seed the bird seed that's been in the room for like over a month um he finally remembered oh this would be a good opportunity to use bird feed bird seed so he made a bird feeder he spent an hour making a bird feeder on his own with bird seed and watching um the watching the the birds see if they would eat you know what's on the bird feeder um and that was an important learning experience i think you know if we had followed schedules i think i would have been frustrated and be like, oh, that means we're an hour behind schedule. That means we'll only start math at 10 and not, you know, and not the nine o'clock in the morning. So um, I instead I try to follow a routine or have a rhythm where where we can um, have space for these spontaneous moments of learning and um, and still get things done. But I'm more flexible in terms of not having, you know, I, I don't really have a schedule, especially not a time schedule. Okay, so um, these learning experiences that I spoke about before, um, you know, there was a few times where I felt like, oh my gosh, what did I just do? Did I just ruin my child because I have him at home and he's not, you know, in kindergarten? Um, you know, how did I miss? You know, I felt like I, I was like messing it up because when he was telling people he hated homeschooling, um, you know, things were just crazy at home. Um, and it's and in homeschooling, the children are with you a lot, you know, um, a lot of the time. And so I felt like, geez, did I mess this up? Um, and so what I had to do was something called D school, which is what um, what um, parents, but also children who have been in a regular school system should go through. Um, it's basically a process in which you let go of how you think learning occurs, like inside a classroom, and really explore new ways of learning. So you kind of forget a lot of the things that are instilled in you on how school should be, and realize that you're not at school anymore, you're at home. This is home education, and um, you know you can make the rules, and your, your children can, can um, have a say in that. So, um, so what I had to do was I had to break away from the brick and mortar school ideology. And um, I was in academia for a very long time. And so was my husband. So this was a hard thing to do. And what helped me was reading Free to Learn, which is um, a book written by Peter Gray. And he goes over um, a lot about schooling, the history of schooling, why, why this happens during school and so forth. Um, and that helped me a lot. And another thing I had to do is I had to stop looking at what other people were doing um, and do what feels right. 
Um, I had to stop looking at what other homeschool families were doing, but also what other schools were doing and just really look at my children and look at our family situation and, and work off what works more for us than trying to match up to what others were doing. So the changes that we made is, this is what we made um, during our deto detox, school detox period. And one is um, we learned about life schooling, different ways of homeschooling, um, you know, learning life skills, world schooling, traveling, um, and learning from those experiences, unschooling, which is basically going off of what children are interested in doing or interested in learning, and then making, um, being a facilitator of that so that they learn what they're interested in, more of an interest led learning. Car schooling, which I've done um, because I'm driving the car, the kids are in the back. It's a great time to just talk about history, um, literature, anything. Um, and then, and then instead of looking at um, our experience as homeschooling, we took the schooling out and looked at it as home education, um, which covers you know more than just academics. And um, and what we realize is that we don't need to follow that five days a week um, schedule that schools do. You know, lessons, um, book work doesn't have to be five days a week, and that textbooks are optional. We don't really need them for everything. Um, there's plenty of other resources and media out there. Um, and then outside of the curriculum box is the ways of learning, and one of them is through you know unit studies. Um, and unit studies basically allows you to pick a topic or the children pick a topic and then you're able to teach um, different aspects of those topics. So right now our children are really into Formula One racing. Um, it's going on right now, you know, even during COVID. Um, so they're into the, the whole Formula One, the car, the drivers, the the um, the racetracks, and so we we're able to use this opportunity. One, it's interest-led because they're gung-ho for anything um, Formula One, but also, okay, so this is an opportunity to learn about cars, Formula One cars. How are they different from regular cars? How do cars work? Um, and also study geography. Where are the tracks? You know, there's you know, right now they're doing, they're going to have a Formula One race this week in Italy. So let's look at Italy. What does Italy look like on the map? You know, what does the, the flag look like? Study the drivers, study math, because you're ranking the drivers, the times and so forth. Um, so that's a, an example of unit study, or sometimes they're called block studies. And another thing I we started doing is because we can, where homeschooling is include the children in decision making of what they want to learn, you know, other than the, the basics of math, language arts, um, what else do you want to learn? You know, what kind of science are you interested in? You know, we just started um, a science astronomy textbook with um, a journal and so forth, so we can spend a good six, seven months on astronomy because my older son really likes space. Um, so really, you're able to personalize education for each child because you you know you have that freedom, and um, and we have also the freedom to take days off um, for whatever reason, and you know use some days off to travel and to see the the world, the city, the country. Um, and then another thing is that comparisons are to death, and this is important um, because you kind of as a as a parent who's homeschooling, you kind of almost, it's hard not to compare your children to how other children are doing, especially the other children in the family, or they just say, you know, you know, who can read or how they're reading, um, who can do division right now, or, you know, like those are the death. So you just let those go because you're on your own path. Every homeschool family's path is very different, um, is different from another's. Um, so the quicker you let go of those, the better off. Um, the more freer, you, you know, we were. Um, so, um, so during the process of de-schooling, I started to develop a philosophy of more of more than a wish list, you know, um, we, you know, than the checklist that I had earlier in the presentation. I kind of wanted to say, okay, let's focus on um more of what we'd like our children to 
what what we like their education to look like. And um, so basically, we wanted to look at focus or prioritize skills over content. Um, you know, like I remember learning um, a lots of dates in history class. Um, you know, we learned the, the stories along with the dates, but um, after the test, you kind of forget it. So, um, but what, but what I did walk away with, you know, with all these content courses that I did take in high school and middle school is the skills, the skills that I learned, whether they're the research, reading skills, comprehension, writing skills. So our focus is more on prioritizing the skills over the content, you know, yes, the math, the, the writing, but also the 21st century skills that I mentioned earlier, because um, those are really important. That's what we would like our children to to really um, hone in on um, in their education process. Another thing is to focus more on process over the end product. Um, learning is not, uh, basically it's a lot less stressful to learn something when you know you're not going to be tested on it or you don't have to produce a certain end product. Um, so we wanted to take that out and really not focus on test results, but um, how to do how did they get to that result? Um, you know, for example, Legos, how did they make a creation with Legos? OK, so how did they struggle and overcome a struggle um, during this process? Um, so really focus more on what they were doing while they were making or while they're learning rather than um, what the end product looks like. Um, allow them to tinker. And that's something that we do with our children, um, really tinker with spare parts and play, you know, with parts without a goal in mind. Um, you know, our kids can um, tinker or even adults can do it um, with anything, work on something for about an hour, not really make anything. Um, but, you know, that is not an hour waste. It's an hour of them actively doing something. Um, and so to really think about that rather than the creation at the end, um, it's, active engagement, active learning. Another thing is that we wanted to focus on um, or prioritize creativity over consumerism. And um, this involved being more aware of how much our children consume, whether it's media, toys, um, social media, TV, YouTube, and how much, you know, are they more actively doing in more of a creative way? Um, use the skills and tools they have to create something new, to create a problem, to host their own YouTube, um, and finding that balance very well. Um, that's something that uh, you know we as parents wanted to do. Was um, you know, for example, they're really into F Formula One, F one racing, and here's a picture of them right here um, oops. Um, in a G4 simulator that um, they built out of cardboard and loose parts. Um, so we like this creativity um, more so than playing a game or a simulating game, which we do allow them to do. But we, we try to have this balance where they're not just consuming, but they also are creating as well. And we also looked at outside learning experiences over textbook learning. Um, you know, this is my son at his first um, Martin Luther King March um, at the beginning of the year. And my two boys cleaning up um, the beach last Friday. Uh, you know, it's more than just learning from a text, but also what can we do to um, encourage them to you know, these world real world experiences. Um, and my older son here going to space camp because he's really into space and he really wanted to go. So um, we wanted to focus on that. Um, we still do textbook learning, but to also keep that in mind. And another thing that um we wanted to that i really try to keep cognizant of is the relationship and the connection that i have with the children over doing a checklist of things that we need to get done um veteran homeschool moms have told me 
one thing you want to save is this relationship because it can get a bit tough um, being a mom and teacher. I mean, they, those are two roles that are very underappreciated, right? Being a teacher and being a mother. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, you want to keep that relationship and save that relationship. So you might not get through everything on your checklist, but really um, have that connection with them. Um, and once, you know, that helps as long as you are connected. But, um, and then we also wanted to give children and myself freedom and time for self-directed activities, learning and initiatives. Um, you know, the paper airplanes story in the beginning was a good example of self-directed activities that we let um, my older son do and how much it grew. Um, and he took it beyond what I could have done for him. Um, so really, we, we really emphasize giving them that extra time um, and that freedom to kind of do what they want to do. Um, you know, our goal is that they have that they um, are able to have this drive that self directed drive for education. So it starts with paper airplanes, it starts with something small and it can grow into big something bigger. Um, so just want to give you a heads up that we have about. 10 minutes left. Okay, thank you. Okay, 10 minutes left. Got it. So I wanted to go over my homeschool life, um, typical, atypical, um, to see if this helps. Um, before the pandemic, um, so what we did was we basically, I do work part time and my husband works full. So um, we would enroll the kids in two days of activities, uh, drop off activities or programs, and that would allow me time to work and also time for myself. Um, and that helps as well. Um, so we found that it was helpful to do two days of that and then three days a week where we're mostly at home. Another thing, I, a rule that we enforced was no TV from nine to six. Um, Monday through Friday, um, you know, when you are homeschooling, <laughs> the children don't leave to go to school. The TV is right there in front of them. So we, I, I have to be firm on that rule um, and, and really not have them, you know, use screens um, during that time. We do use screens during that time for more education or videos, um, but for, for leisure, um, the TV is usually not on from nine to six. And then the classroom, um, we don't do a Pinterest classroom. I told you my fail with that. Um, what we do use is a dining table and that works perfect. Um, it's in the middle of the house. And, um, and then we have these carts that we bought from the container store and we just roll them to the dining table or to wherever they want to use, um, wherever they wanna take their work to do. You know, sometimes it's the floor, sometimes a couch. So they just roll them there. Um, my picture on the bottom is a picture of our, our tinker space, which took about three years to put together. Um, cause I just mentioned that I do spend a lot of time, have the kids, um, spend a lot of time tinkering and usually is this clean for about an hour and then it becomes a, a mess. But I got all, all of these parts from resource depot, which is a great place in West Palm beach, um, that you can get a whole bunch of spare parts for very cheap. Um, Another thing that I've done, what I've learned is that to just basically have a list of tasks to do for the week as opposed to day by day. Um, and this helps a lot with the older children because they are able to time manage. You know, if they get a lot done the first two days of the week, then the three, the rest of the days are pretty easy. So um, this is for my child going into third grade. And, um, and I have upcoming co-op events, which are on hold until I don't know indefinitely but also um, you know don't forget to play to build something to go outside and to teach me something teach mom something because I think it's important for them to be on the other side not just me being the teacher but also them teaching me um, and this only takes up a few hours you know one of the quote one of the things that I picked up from a developmental um, conference was that um, one researcher said that, you know, 80% of what parents say to their children are imperatives, are commands, um, you know, get up, 
you know, eat breakfast, get ready. But we we kind of just, you know, so I purposely try to not do that. Um, it's hard, but so I try to let them, you know, be in the driver's seat sometimes and also talk to them about different things without being so directive or imperative. Um, you know, when days get tough, it's good to go outside and just go for a walk or go for a field trip or something. So do something spontaneous um, because that helps. And that's what we do. Sometimes we just take a spontaneous field trip. Um, and, um, you know, one of the, I read stories to them. Um, that's my favorite part of homeschooling or is just to read to them. So I read to them at lunch and I read to them at nighttime. Um, and I find that a lot can be done over a meal, meaning reading to them, discussing history, um, literature can be done over lunch, can be done over dinner, breakfast. It's a perfect opportunity to, to connect and to just chat um, about topics and so forth. And, um, you know, we, we, because we homeschool, we are we have flexibility and when we can travel. So when I well, you know when we are able to score really cheap tickets, we travel somewhere. You know, if the pandemic didn't happen, we would have gone to London in the summer. Um, you know, all four of us for about a thousand dollars because I found a really good cheap deal through Scott's Cheap's flights, which basically alerts you on cheap deals. But um, basically, we are. You know, we want our kids to know what it's like to be strangers in a strange land type of thing, um, to be open to new ways of life, new experiences. Um, so we book air, you know, we book bed and breakfasts in weird spots like on farms or a haunted hotel or something like that. Um, and and just enjoy and try to have fun. Um, since the pandemic um, or during the pandemic, things changed um, with our homeschooling. Um, I was a lot. I was more lenient um, because, as an adult, I was going through a lot. You know, we're going through this thing that we've never experienced before. Um, lots of feelings, lots of fear, loss, and certainly challenges. So, what do we think our kids are going through? So, I eased up a lot of our homeschooling things, um, our duties, and just let them play. And um, I found that during this time, it was more. They did more creative stuff um, than usually they do. Um, so um, that's what life during the pandemic looked for us, where they made up their own games. Um, my older one did his own, you know, remote control boat, and they just, um, you know, I took the pressures off of school and and really just enjoyed that time. And you can because you're homeschooling. That's the flexibility that we have. So um, we have our good days and our bad days, and it's a journey, and it's about relationships at the end of the day. And sometimes you just have to ditch the books and enjoy some vitamin C. So I like this quote, um, as for the future, your task is not to foresee it, but to enable it. And that's all I have for you. I would like to thank the library for having me. Um, and the library has a great resource, um, homeschool resource page, um, LibGuide um, at the FAU library. And, um, and I have more resources here. And I think these slides can be available to you if you'd like, right? Um, and I list the curriculum that I use um, for those who have younger children who are curious. Um, Logic of English, Matthew C, Story of the World, and a literature um, five in a row curriculum <clears throat> that I love. And the Living Learning Library in Jupiter is has a wealth of children's literature books um, that I visit once a month, um, which is a great treasure. And I have my resources, and that's it. Okay, thank you. So if you have any questions, we have a minute for questions. If not, I appreciate your time. And if you'd like to email me, um, I would love to hear from you. My email is simonelchin at outlook.com if you have any questions. Um, I'll do my best to answer them. And thank you. Thank you are seeing a lot of comments um, saying thank you so much for this. This has been very helpful. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Oh, cool.
Oh, great. Thank you. I appreciate it. I can't see the comments, but thank you. Some of them come to the host privately. Oh, <laughs> okay. That's why. All right. Um, we also had mentioned that someone um, noted that their child is five and going into kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I hope this is useful for you. And welcome to homeschooling kindergarten. Like I was told, you can't um, mess up kindergarten. You got this. So I just want to let all of the attendees know that I will email you all a copy of the PowerPoint as well as a survey for you to take and let us know how um, what your thoughts are on this presentation. We want to thank you again for joining us and a special thank you to Simone for putting together this presentation. You'll receive the email with a brief survey very shortly. Uh, we also will share the link to the recording of this se session, which will be posted on our YouTube channel. And to stay up to date on our upcoming events, follow us on all social media channels at FAU Libraries. Have a great evening. All right, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Tanessa.